Well, I think it's about time. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for taking a minute to come see us toward the very end of Synergy. I'm Dave Potter. I'm a solutions architect for Netscaler, uh, and more recently focusing on Netscaler in the cloud. And with me is my peer, Stan Nitkowski, and Stan will be uh, presenting the second half, going into a bit more about the content. So what we're here uh, covering today is really um, a high level. This is what's possible to do with Netscaler in the cloud. And these aren't just things that we're going to be talking about that you could do someday. These are things that you can do today. So really, the takeaway that we want to show is that it is easier than ever to deploy Netscaler in the cloud. And it's possible to do things like um, advanced configuration today through some of the new tools that we're going to show you on the screen. So to start, I'm going to talk about deploying the Netscaler in Azure, what we do in a special case to provide high availability in Azure. Then I'll cover a similar detail for AWS. And then we'll cover a little bit about how to distribute your traffic globally between those different environments. Now, I realize not everyone is in the cloud, so a lot of the solutions here will also work with on-prem deployments. So really, the true takeaway here is the solutions that we're showing are really about going into the cloud, not exclusively. It's about being able to extend into the cloud in more of a hybrid scenario. And then toward the end, we'll show uh, how to configure gateway services and then provide things like single sign-on to your apps using Netscaler in this hybrid environment. So feel free to tweet about the session as we go through the content. I don't want to make this a big, boring dump of information on you guys. I'd prefer if you uh, want to jump up and ask questions as we go or if you want to raise your hand and come up to the mic, uh, that would be great so that we don't just get into one mode where you're just listening and kind of not really taking in some of the information that we have for you. So I want to make sure that you get as much out of it as uh, we're giving here to you. Um, please take some time during this opportunity to ask questions um, or tweet, and hopefully we can all connect and get a little bit smarter together. So to start things off, um, there's a couple types of VPXs that we'd like to see deployed into the cloud. Now, you're, of course, you can use any form of Netscaler. Um, it can be one that you bring your own license to. It can be very small. It can be very large. Um, for our hybrid multi-cloud solutions, we typically recommend starting with a VPX 1000 and going up to a VPX 3000. Now, the VM type or the instance type that is used in Azure is the DS3 type, DS3 V2, and that provides the best performance that we've seen overall in terms of the price to performance ratio. Now, on AWS, we actually prefer to use the M4. You can deploy a Netscaler in an M3 or even smaller container instance types, but we find that the M4, um, 2x to large and the 4x large, really provides the capability to burst. So if you want to do something more than a few megabits, maybe you need more processing for your app firewall or security policies, then we do have quite a bit of performance. Now, if you notice on the side there where my throughput is, uh, we were able to achieve the full 3 gigs on Azure due to a lot of the optimization they've done at the network layer. Um, AWS is a little bit less. It's less not because of the cores and the packet engines, but it's less due to the way that the network drivers integrate with the Netscaler. Um, so I'll just let you know uh, there is a bullet there at the top saying SRIOV will be tested. We're currently testing that in AWS. And with SRIOV enabled in AWS, we're seeing stats equal to Azure. So deploying Netscaler in Azure, there's a number of components that you need to be aware of uh, inside the Azure environment. And these aren't necessarily restrictions with Netscaler, but they're restrictions with Azure. One thing to be aware of is if you're going to deploy Netscaler in Azure, is you need to think about how many people are going to access this uh, and do configurations on it. Um, you're limited to about 25 accounts per subscription in Azure. So you need to decide, am I going to make um, a VPX managed through an orchestration tool, or am I going to give everyone direct access into the portal to do provisioning? Um, so that's specific within the subscription. Within the portal itself, you need to have a browser, and you just go in and assign resources. Now, we do have a solution template to, to deploy the Netscaler VPX and the VPX Express, which I'll cover in a minute. But before you can do that deployment, you need to go into the marketplace and subscribe to the Netscaler product. Once you have that subscription into your account, then you can go ahead and deploy VPX as any other resource in the marketplace. 
So the way that these deployments happen uh, within Azure is we recommend having three different network interfaces for each VPX. And the reason we do that is we like to see management traffic out of band with data traffic and the high availability traffic to maintain in its own area. Within Azure, these are individually called VNets or virtual networks. So the best practice uh, when using our solution template will actually create these three different VNets for you, or you can go in and use your existing VNets when you do the deployment. You don't have to have three, by the way. If you're thinking, I just want to do a basic proof of concept, I want everything on one interface, one IP address, that's perfectly supported as well. Uh, but it doesn't allow you to do or maintain your security compliance policies that you may have to think about, which would be you know, locking down your management interface and so forth. Now, what gets deployed with the solution template? There are a number of components to provide high availability with Netscaler. Uh, the key component there at the top is ALB. We are using the Azure Load Balancer in front of the Netscaler VPX in order to provide high availability in Azure itself. Some of the other components here are the different interfaces and the IP addresses that are assigned to that. All these components get deployed automatically with our solution template so that you don't have to go out and build them yourself. Now you can go back and make changes as you want to maybe add another application. You'll just go into ALB, add more to it. Um, in terms of um, the most that you can do within Azure, we do have a limit of eight network interface cards or IP addresses on each individual interface. And um, in terms of the maximum number of IPs per NIC, Azure does have a limit of five. So think of Netscaler, you can put up to five different IPs. You may want to think about how you do your load balancing with, with the ALB, whether that is doing port-based translation to the Netscaler or doing one-to-one -one IPs. So there are considerations and restrictions within Azure just to be aware of. Now, Azure does support jumbo frames, so we can, in theory, and uh, we're working on a solution with Netscaler to do clustering within Azure. Until that's available, there are other ways to scale Netscaler itself. So if you want to grow Netscaler, we have a way to expand that in Azure as well as expanding the backend services automatically. So there is some goodies there in terms of um, expansion and auto scale. Now, in terms of the HA um, setup, so I mentioned there's three NICs. We like to see the management interface have its own dedicated VNet, and that's just so that your traffic doesn't get confused or mixed up with other IPs on the network. Um, the way that we integrate with ALB is to have it in front of the Netscaler, and ALB is basically configured in what's called direct server return. Now, the reason we're doing that is with DSR mode, um, basically the, the idea for that is to provide a failover for the Netscaler itself. Now, why ALB instead of just using Netscaler HA, you might be thinking. Um, the challenge with using Netscaler HA itself is that the network language within the cloud provider itself is not conducive to having an IP address move between different devices automatically or seamlessly. So in order to provide the high availability, we use ALB basically doing health checks to each Netscaler. And when you do an HA transition of Netscaler in what's called independent network config, then the ALB picks up that the other Netscaler has gone active. So that's the trick for us to do high availability within Azure. It's not a stateful failover, but it does allow you to maintain persistence with your users um, and to do it quickly. Now, in terms of um, the IP considerations, um, we're very flexible here. You can put a single NIC, single IP for your entire deployment, or you can do multiple ones. Just keep in mind there is some restrictions within Azure, mainly like the maximum of five IP addresses. Now, in terms of deploying the Netscaler itself, it is as easy as just jumping into the portal and then clicking in the top and searching for Netscaler 12.0 HA. So when you put that in, you're going to be prompted with some few basic things on the side. There's really just four different drop-downs. The solution template is really filling in all the rest of the resources that are needed for the solution. The very bottom, um, you'll have to just say, I want to purchase this. I want to add it into my account. Now, what I'm not showing here is what type of Netscaler you're deploying. Now, that's all up to you. So when you deploy Netscaler 12, you can decide, do I want to bring, uh, do I want to bring my own license to this? Maybe I have one that I already own. Or maybe I don't have a license yet, and I just want to make this as part of um, an ongoing subscription. All that's available when you go ahead and do this deployment with the template. You can choose whether to pick up a license on the fly, or you can use one of your own. And that's available in the drop downs. Now, the process for provisioning itself, once you get done and you say, I'm ready to kick this off, it is a fairly long time in Azure. I've noticed up to about 10 minutes to deploy the HA pair of EPXs 
get them up and get them running. Now what's cool about this solution is actually that um, it's going in and configuring things like the NS root account credentials, the IP addresses on the Netscaler itself, and it's configuring HA. So the only thing left to do once the solution template has finished is to come back in and add your, net, um, your application config into Netscaler itself. So we have a document online. It's very useful. Um, if you just search for Netscaler, VRD, and Azure, um, you're going to come up with a big cookbook that shows exactly all the different components that fall into place for building out the solution. It's not just going to run how to do the solution template itself, but it's going to go into the individual components. So if you're curious about changing maybe something in the solution template or maybe deploying a slightly different model, the VRD will, will guide you along that way. So it's not meant to be some kind of a, the VRD is more of a reference book. It's mainly there for you to get in-depth information about specific features that you'll be using in that environment. It's really not there for you to kind of look at it from A to B or A to Z and try to pick up the deployments because it's got a lot of different details for a lot of different solutions. In terms of um, simplifying the deployment, we recently announced and launched the VPX Express in Azure and also in AWS. Um, loading the VPX Express is interesting and I think it's uh, an exciting tool for us because it makes it possible for you to test Netscaler without having to purchase anything. So if you want to just try out Netscaler itself, look for the VPX Express. This is just a single NIC, single IP Netscaler. Um, it deploys as a standalone model and allows you to do something like see how would Netscaler behave with my application or in my environment? Is it something for me? Now, I have a note up there at the top. This is beginning with release 12 of build 57. So that is one uh, generation previous to our, our newest release. So if you're looking to try out Netscaler, you can get version 12 for free. A very small throughput version of that will be available for you perpetually in the cloud. Now, we have two different ways to deploy that. In Azure, it's with a solution template. And in AWS, you'll actually have to go to GitHub, look for Citrix, and we have a series of cloud formation templates that will pull in the AMI or the image for the VPX Express. Now, high availability in AWS is a little bit different from Azure. Instead of using the ALB at the front end, we're actually providing a, a more robust failover within AWS, but we do it in conjunction with ELB, even if you want. Um, you need to consider or take into consideration the failover times uh, when you do this transition in this environment, because we're actually um, elevating the solutions here across multiple different platform products. So it's no longer possible for you to be in the same bridge domain and actually just do a gratuitous ARP, have a failover, and have your failover time be small. So there's a lot of considerations that need to go into play when you decide, how quickly do I need this transition to be? Is this something I can put in Azure? Is it something I need to have in AWS? Do I need to have a lot of uptime or a little bit of uptime? Now, in terms of um, the HA configuration itself and um, standing that up, uh, within AWS, it's just as easy as uh, your standard Netscaler HA failover. So you don't need to think about having something public in front that um, would manage the failover itself. So that's a little bit simpler within AWS. Now, uh, the next step to just HA failover and say maybe you want to do something like have um, site steering or maybe you want to provide services in multiple availability zones, we have a protocol for that. It's called global server load balancing. And it works very easily with, between clouds with Netscaler in place. Now, Netscaler itself actually doesn't have to be the cloud load balancer. You could use this in conjunction with ALB or ELB doing things like doing your basic server load balancing on the back end. We have a new feature within GSLB called domain-based services and autoscale groups. What this allows you to do within Netscaler in the cloud specifically is being able to do stuff like, I want to refer to this external name of this address, and what Netscaler will do is then resolve that name to an IP and then send users to that IP address. So Netscaler is dynamically picking up the IP address of your external service in the cloud, which surely will move if you change availability zones or maybe you deploy it to another site. So we pick that up automatically and we can do site steering there. And then locally within those zones, you can have Netscaler or you could have any other load balancing device there. This service will work with all types of um, devices. In terms of um, doing auto scale groups, it's as easy as going into the Netscaler on that specific platform, and there'll be a drop down to select which auto scale group you want to deploy the services on. So when you turn on domain based services under your vServer, additional capabilities show up 
like being able to resolve the fully qualified domain name into IP addresses. So the idea here is just being able to make it a little bit easier for you to support your services in the cloud, especially where the cloud um, may be changing the IP addresses frequently. Or maybe if you have something like a follow the sun model and you may be scaling up or scaling down your services, all this sort of happens behind the scenes. So you don't have to manually go into the Netscaler and change your IP addresses as things um, come on and offline across the network. So I mentioned uh, being aware of your transition or your failover time, you really need to add up what is your service level requirement on a per application basis. So with GSLB, we're actually able to do load balancing here and site steering based on an individual application. So if your apps have different requirements, you may want to take that into account whether GSLB is part of the setup and whether HA transitioning is part of that setup. If you have a requirement for five nines or four nines, for example, and you have a database service uh, from the cloud, will you be able to still maintain that service level um, or, or not if the database goes down? So Nescaler helps you provide um, a more available, um, high availability time um, if you go ahead and take that into account. So there's, um, here's some um, algorithms and some ways of doing that calculation. But basically the idea is you want to find out what is the high availability for all the services providing the application rendering. So if your application happens to use a, a database within the cloud service, you need to take that into account when you convert and um, calculate your failover times. Um, we found that with GSLB in the cloud, um, when you're looking at DNS, you're looking at failovers in terms of seconds, um, we're finding that you can maintain a fairly high level of uptime if you combine your different solutions here. So we have a VRD on AWS similar to Azure. So if you're curious about, again, how do I do these configurations, what do the different screens look like, um, how many steps is it to configure my different services like domain-based auto-scaling. All of that is in our document. Um, if you were to Google Netscaler VRD and AWS, you'll come up with that document. Again, huge cookbook. It'll give you all the detail about individual features. So think of this more like a, a master reference guide. Now, in terms of um, why GSLB, uh, why not just do HA? So the reason we've got GSLB in the solution to begin with is because within the cloud, things become much more ephemeral. So we st I, I mentioned the domain-based services in order to resolve things because IPs are changing constantly. Well, if you want to provide scale not only in a, your own um, availability zone, but you want it to scale across regions, then you need things like GSLB to do that. GSLB works um, typically because it's a domain-based service. It needs an external-facing static address. So that's really your DNS infrastructure. The services on it are fully dynamic. And there's some security uh, rules that need to go at play. So Netscaler itself to provide GSLB would be a domain name server uh, for your site's um, subdomains. So what you can do uh, overall, um, this is an example of uh, GSLB set up across different environments. The idea here is that with Netscaler doing the site steering, then your sites can be literally in any different type of cloud. It really doesn't matter now whether your service is in Azure, AWS, maybe on-prem, or a mix of all of that, because you can use Netscaler to um, provide the management and the site steering. Now, we have some new features in Netscaler Mass, which um, Stan's going to cover after me. Um, and what that includes is using Netscaler Mass to um, automate some of this deployment and pushing policies out to Netscaler. Obviously, there's a lot of Netscalers on this picture, and they're in different regions. So it wouldn't make sense if you'd had to go to each one to make changes to control the traffic going into each region. And so we simplify that uh, with the mechanism in Stylebooks, which we'll go into um, next. So what are some of the different things that GSLB and deploying Netscaler in the cloud allows you to achieve? It allows you to do something like have different um, solutions available across different environments. It gives you that flexibility so that if your application is maybe transitioning to the cloud or maybe it has different requirements in terms of scale, then with Netscaler and GSLB, we can provide that kind of flexibility and connectivity. So maybe your application needs to go online or become highly available for a, a burst in demand. The solutions that we have pick that up, work with the cloud services to automatically scale as needed um, with different policies. So uh, we are solution architects, I mentioned at the beginning, so we do have a lab that's set up and we actually have this environment, so all the solutions that we are put together in this presentation 
um, are actually in our lab online. And this is where we make our, a lot of our reference material from. So this solution really does work. Um, if people are interested in getting more information, I invite you to look at the VRD um, and um, have some confidence or know um, that our lab and our own information went into making this. It wasn't something that was just textbook or potentially available. So NetScaler is available in AWS, Azure. You can do it in high availability mode. You can also do things like try out the VPX Express and just see if it's going to be a fit for you. Um, there's different advantages in the different environments, but the one takeaway I want to maintain here is that even though they do provide different solutions individually, NetScaler is able to combine all those different services and provide a seamless pane of glass or service high level for your application. So even though they have their own scaling mechanisms and their own um, global server load balancing mechanisms and load balancers, NetScaler is able to work within the cloud natively with all those different functions to be able to provide a more uniform interface for your apps. And with Mass, which Stan will get into, a more uniform interface for your application owners as well to do the configuration. Okay, so with that, I'm going to, uh, we're going to change gears and talk more about Stylebooks and what Mass can do in this environment. Great, thank you so much, Dave. Uh, excellent. So, um, just uh, you know, uh, we've met our architectural requirements. We're able to deploy in public clouds now. We're able to use hybrid models, and really, what the second half of this presentation is is kind of like you know, let's get the services online. Let's figure out how we're going to manage these environments and some of the common use cases that we have. Um, and so the one that I kind of picked out today was around SAML and SSO for third-party SaaS applications and some of the um, activities um, specifically around those because we do get some escalations from time to time, a lot of authentication questions because as you go into these unified gateways and we start standing up these services, there's associated configurations with them. So the very first thing we want to do is get our management of our public cloud infrastructure, our platform services under control. And so this is what the mass agent actually does. We have mass agents. We're a software first company and agents are the way that we communicate directly into these public cloud platforms. And then we take that and we use that um, as the agent to communicate to the Citrix public cloud, which is where our MOS service is. And as Dave mentioned, the reason we're doing that is because we don't want to continue to chase instances around the world because we have global or multiple deployment presences. We want a unified management and control plane, and we use these agents. And so the two, uh, the two images you see on the screen today are the agent deployments within the Azure AWS infrastructure. We deploy those agents. We're going to do some configuration on these. Um, there's actually a, uh, I think we have a slide out of order. No, we don't. Um, we uh, connect these agents into our subscription within the Citrix cloud itself. And then once we do that, we have the ability to go into the Citrix cloud. So you see the first thing we're going to do is enable some feature sets on the NetScalers. Um, and then we're going to go into the actual tile within the Citrix cloud dashboard. We're going to invoke that tile. And within that tile, you can see I'm already in step three going down, down to a style book. So once the infrastructure is in place and we want to start deploying services, we move into the MOS platform itself, the service platform, and then we start standing up these services. From that perspective, we're going to have some parameters that we're going to input, and these are generally re reflected by the architecture of the platform service or whatever cloud we're running in. And we're going to go ahead and execute. MOS is going to use its secure APIs to talk to whatever instances um, that you have selected to push configuration to. And you can kind of see in the center there that we're actually bringing up services. Um, so as these services come online, you can go uh, either within MOS or even on that um, specific instance remotely and see that those services have all been configured and pushed via this declarative style book into those particular instances within your uh, public cloud infrastructure. Now, one of the things that um, frequently comes up around authentication is um, our use of the SAML protocol 2.0 specifically, which is a specification. And so um, if you've done any type of SaaS applications and you want to provide single sign-on from this in infrastructure using the SAML protocol, you know, there's a few things that, um, that have uh, kind of, you know, uh, we have provided enhancements for um, in addition to clarifying. So um, not only do we have uh, the concept of SAML, which is great for providing that single sign-on experience, 
But in the past, you know, we've kind of had to generate profiles and understand and define those applications on an application by application basis. Um, and then we also had to determine, you know, are we pulling attributes from an external, um, an LDAP uh, directory? And so even though that SAML 2.0 is a standard and um, generally the implementation is very consistent, every application provider um, does have this notion of required attributes, optional attributes, and not required attributes. And they're largely, um, largely, I would say, you know, 75% of the time, they're the same, but they can be very unique and different. Um, and so that, uh, if you need to map out those attributes, that can become a little bit of an activity until you first figure that out. You have to work with your uh, third-party SaaS provider, make sure that those definitions are correct so that when you build your assertion and post it into their application as in, in uh, service provider mode, that the authentication attribute is actually valid. Um, so. What we've done from that perspective, you know, uh, if you kind of look at what has happened over time, you know, we've always, uh, we've had to, ha we've had this requirement to kind of parse down through the application itself, understand some of the parameters of that SAS application, which you see there reflected in the relay state of this expression. And then we actually have to attach a profile within the SAML profile on Netscaler. So that's the SAML portion of the IDP, but then within LDAP, we actually have to tie that user from our single sign-on perspective to make sure that we're extracting the correct value um, from, from our user uh, authentication directory and that we're taking those attributes and posting them in. So what we have actually done is simplify this um, there, uh, for you within the Netscaler. So what you will see here actually is that we have this concept now of this issuer that is a definition of the service provider ID. And we can now set all of our policy expressions within LDAP to be true. And LDAP policies now understand that if it is uh, bound to a SAML profile, we're gonna go ahead and take that value of issuer and we're gonna match those applications. So this will greatly simplify LDAP profiles as well as your SAML profiles as you continue to scale out your third-party single sign-on solution and bring those web applications into your solution. Um, and then you can actually see here at the bottom, it's as simple as a profile, my profile with an ID. When we reference that keyword now within our policy infrastructure, it understands which, uh, where that definition is applied to the SAML profile and the value within the LDAP policy expression just needs to be true now. So that eliminates a lot of the parsing and any of the other, you know, kind of detective work that we may have had to do with those third uh, party SaaS providers in the past. Now, here is um, an example of the simplification. So you see this default authentication group. We have a definition within SAML. Under LDAP, we have a definition, we have a policy expression that's referencing the definition. So now Netscaler is intelligent enough to say, hey, let's simplify these SAML application deployments, have the expression within the LDAP policy refer back to my SAML profile. My SAML profile has a keyword that's defined in this authentication group, and now I can pick users out of that extraction process, just like we do for traditional logon scenarios, okay? And then so from the bottom, you can actually see we have changed the command syntax as well. So in the past, we've had this group. Now we just use an, a user ID as a member of, and that policy expression will parse that member specifically for that profile. Within UG to configure um, this LDAP, and I'm just gonna kind of step through a couple of these uh, scenarios, but you know, really, um, the LDAP is what's driving the attributes as well as the authentication within the Netscaler. Um, so as we continue through this uh, path, we're gonna make sure that we have our, our vServices set up, that this is an authentication vServer, and that we have that policy defined. Now, one of the things that I like to kind of highlight and make sure that everyone's aware of is the Unified Gateway Configuration Wizard. And so um, if you're familiar with how we've consolidated all of our URLs into a single URL in the Netscaler, we expose content switching concepts into the Netscaler Unified Gateway. And so in order to do that, we actually use a zero address and then go and bind directly into a content switch vServer as well as our authentication vServer. 
So in order to achieve that, um, you know, I think a lot of folks traditionally in the past have gone in and set up multiple gateways or directly addressable IP addresses within the gateway. And the reason I'm actually showing the wizard is, is because this is, the, uh, this is the mechanism where you can use that zero address. Now you can certainly do this manually, but most folks, as, as they kind of transition from an old infrastructure that has multiple URLs for different types of services and they consolidate everything into a single URL infrastructure, this wizard will walk you directly through this. And what this is actually doing, again, is as I mentioned, this is putting the zero um, address uh, on the gateway itself, and then we're referencing, we're being bound into a content switch v server for our NAT translation and our IP addressing. Um, so this wizard will help you go through that, and you can actually see the steps on the right. We define our, our v server, our certificates, uh, uh, the authentication that we had in the previous uh, slide, and then we're able to complete um, our unified gateway configuration. From this perspective, as we mentioned, everything within that expression now is true. We don't have to be specific within that expression uh, policy um, on these LDAP, on, for LDAP in order to provide authentication to multiple different applications that are keyword specific. And this is what it looks like. So once our NetScaler is up, you'll see the vServer as well as our authentication profile that reflects where we're going to extract that authentication from and match those attributes for those SAML profiles, okay? Oh, and by the way, <laughs> snuck it in. Available in 12.1, we are providing you SaaS application catalogs. So as you go directly into an application now and you so choose to deploy a SaaS type of application, we have an application catalog and you can actually see from the catalog that we have a dynamic list of third-party SaaS applications that you can choose. And so what's nice about this is this is a dynamic service on the NetScaler. As we continue to add third parties, this list will you know, refresh at a given interval, interval, update itself. And basically what we've done is taken all of those SAML configurations over time, abstracted away a series of those configurations, those attributes, we know these definition fields, and we put this into a template for you. And it's all templatized via this catalog. And this is what it looks like. So if you actually go in and um, run one of these applications or create an application from a template, you'll see that we render that GUI dynamically with those required parameters for any of the attributes or information that's specific and or unique to that application. Okay, so from a bookmark perspective, again, old way of kind of doing things. We used to use some uh, open source tools, some websites. We would, you know, effectively go um, populate information, maybe copy our signing certificate, add some attributes, and then we could use a tool to generate a metadata file. Um, and so that has worked very well for us over time, but one of the enhancements that you'll see in 12.1 as well is that we now have the ability for metadata export and metadata import, and that's on a per v server basis on the NetScaler. So as you're setting up your applications, you can directly query this path string on those v servers. So if you want to provide your metadata to someone else, we will dynamically extract it from the NetScaler and provide it to you in that format. If you are bringing in applications, you can import into, directly into a SAML profile. And so all of those settings, for example, will then be captured from that query via the service provider's metadata availability. And we will take that and NetScaler will dynamically generate a SAML profile for that application. Everyone's supposed to cheer. So a uh, big enhancement that you'll see in 12.1 and just really simplifying so that you don't need to use additional tool sets or go to different places in order to complete your SAML uh, your configurations as you go through. From a single sign-on perspective, um, you know, the concept of the bookmark is how we're putting the applications into the gateway at render time. Um, and so what we're actually doing is, is we're creating a bookmark and we're defining that application as SAS type, which you see on the far left. 
And then from here, we have our specific profile information. Profile is application specific per application. And then what we're actually doing is we're using a bookmark within the gateway and we're binding that into our gateway. So that at render time, these bookmarks will be generated for you. And this is an example of what they look like. So any of these, now what's interesting is, is we're not discriminating between VDI, SAS, or any other type of application. But for the SAS applications like the Office 365, the Salesforce.com, when you click on those links now as published bookmarks within that gateway, Netscaler grabs that information and actually reaches out into that service provider, performs that SAML post with all of your assertion requirements into that application, gets the uh, response back, and then your application will be signed on um, and launched for you as a single sign-on application. And so when you look at that application, there is no uh, log on prompt, and if you generally look somewhere within the context of that application, you'll see that the account and user credentials that are reflected are the same ones that were initially entered when you came into Netscaler as your identity provider. Okay, so um, as we kind of wrap up here, uh, you know, everything that Dave has covered, everything that I have covered, is all available as reference material. The use case definitions, the reference architectures, um, as well as any of our designs um, for hybrid and multi-cloud scenarios. So make sure you refer back into this deck um, for any of that information. And you can actually see we've actually broken them down into what the use case is, the architecture, and the, uh, the VPX, um, and on AWS as well for some of the sizing information. As Dave mentioned, we will continue to pro, uh, provide and update um, single root IOV uh, performance information. So now that we have the ability to run um, our packet engines with direct access to hardware, you're going to see some, pretty f some fairly significant performance numbers. Um, so you'll see probably some rivals between the different cloud providers in that performance. But what's interesting is, as you know, we're north of six gigs of throughput on a single VPX appliance in these public clouds. So you think about that and you know, the, kind of, the, the concept that I can have a virtualized instance and, and from a scalability perspective, that is significant scale on a single instance. And then you couple that with the fact that you have our cloud native integration. So your auto scale, your CloudWatch components are all natively integrated into the NetScaler for the DBS and the dynamic service uh, allocation and teardown, you have a horizontal uh, scalability uh, platform. And then you couple that with your GSLB solution, you know, uh, there's really no limit to the amount of performance that we can provide on public clouds, as well as steer the traffic uh, in and out of those clouds. The case studies will continue to be updated. Again, a lot of times we uh, have customers that um, agree to allow us to use very specific details of their deployments, and as those come through, we continue to update those as well. If you're not familiar with Dave's video library, and I say that uh, half-jokingly, tongue-in-cheek, but Dave posts an enormous amount of video content um, that's all been aggregated, and you will traditionally hear his voice moderating those videos as you go through. Um, so there's an extraordinary amount of content and he's also taken it and published it into a YouTube format so that it's all consistent and publicly available via the channel and the catalog. Um, so it's not some video that's hidden somewhere, you have to request it, uh, those types of things. Everything is available and published on YouTube for that reason so that you consume it, can consume it uh, directly as a channel. All of our auto scale, um, that's our latest one. So the auto scale uh, integration that we've done on Netscaler for both uh, AWS and Azure is available there as well. And as Dave mentioned, the single NIC VPX, VPX Express. Um, so this is a very easy way for you to deploy Netscaler. If you want to test functionality, look at versions. Uh, if you have a POC, um, any of those types of activities, VPX Express is perfect for that. What we find as customers mature, they tend to kind of go down that use case chart that he showed you earlier, from single NIC to uh, multi NIC to um, multi NIC, multi IP. 
Um, and then finally, as we kind of wrap up here, make sure you do us a favor. There's a feedback option within your mobile app. Uh, rate our session for us. Um, we will continue to add content and uh, specifically the cloud native feature sets um, from our solution architecture team uh, for any of the enhancements that we have within these clouds. And as we continue to add public clouds into the portfolio um, as platform services for NetScaler workloads. So with that, um, I don't know, if, uh, make sure, uh, you know, the survey information is critical. Um, our marketing and events team takes a look at that. So if you have a moment, uh, it would be very helpful for you to provide some feedback. And then beginning on, May, on Monday, all of the sessions um, on Citrix uh, TV are available for you as an attendee. So if there's something that you didn't see or something that you would like to um, watch again or follow up on, please join us there. So with that, um, Dave, I think uh, you know, we'd like yeah. to thank you for coming out, attending our session, and enjoy the rest of your conference. Thanks, guys.